Well, hello there, guys. I'm Dana, and welcome back to Inverter Always. We are on episode six now of our Daikin VRVS install series. In today's video, we're going to be talking about line voltage wiring, uh, what the equipment requires for line voltage. It's much different than mini splits. And we're also going to be talking about communication wire and what is a daisy chain, where should you be landing these wires on each terminal block of each unit, and of course, the thermostat as well. So you guys, lots of information to get through in a short period of time. Today's video shouldn't be too hard since we're really only talking about these two things. Uh, if you guys enjoyed today's video, please click the like button below. It really helps out my channel. And if you haven't already, please consider subscribing. All right, let's jump right in. Now you guys, before we get started today, I just wanted to reiterate in case you didn't hear me before or in case I haven't already mentioned this, this is not a factory authorized training. This is not a training in any way, shape or form. This is just a discussion. I wanted to get you guys the important bullet points, the important information pulled from my experience and discussions and past trainings, the installation and operation manuals, things from the engineering and service manuals, really just give you guys the bullet points give you guys the breakdown the things you need to know the things you need to look out for this is not a training and i just want to make sure that i make that clear all right so when it comes to wiring you guys there are really only two things to talk about here today and the first one is going to be line voltage it's really 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 important to communicate with the electrician whether the electrician works for your company or is a subcontractor of sorts, you need to make sure to communicate with that person. Buy him a beer, bring him some cookies, whatever you gotta do, because he needs to know that all of the indoor units require 208, 230, single phase, line voltage power. The indoor units are not powered from the outdoor unit like they are on mini splits. The Daikin VRVS, VRF equipment in general, is powered separately it's not a mini split, totally different animal. So that is probably like first big bullet point of the day. Make sure you know, make sure you plan for ahead of time running a circuit to your indoor units. Now, the good news is you can almost power just about all of your indoor units off of one 15 amp circuit breaker with a humongous little note asterisk at the end of that sentence. When you have a residential application with no strip heat on your air handler, then you can generally use one 15 amp circuit breaker to power all of your indoor units. Commercial applications excluded, anything with strip heat excluded. So really the idea here is I might have a house with four cassettes. Each of the cassettes pulls less than an amp. I can put all four cassettes on one 15 amp circuit breaker. If I have an air handler, the FXTQ air handler, the multi-positional air handler that has a little bay, a little slot inside the air handler for a backup strip heater, if I have that installed, then that unit will need its own circuit breaker with the circuit breaker sized appropriately for that strip heater. Separately from the air handler, all the rest of your indoor units can then be powered from a 15 amp circuit breaker. And then of course your outdoor unit will also need 208, 230 volt power. So it will always have its own dedicated circuit breaker. Now, as far as sizing goes, it's important to size your circuit breaker for the maximum overcurrent protection, your MOP, not your MCA. On the three ton, I believe that is a 30 amp. Don't quote me on it. I would need to verify with the submittal data as you guys should as well on anything we talk about on this channel, always verify in the documentation. The four ton and the five ton is a 35 amp. So usually you have a 40 amp circuit breaker with 35 amp fuses at the disconnect. I only know that because that's what I have on my house is a five ton and I used to have a four ton. So the electrical is the same on the four and the five ton. So 30 or 35 amps. Um, I've heard the three ton might be 25 amps now. 
again, that's something that you're going to want to check because it may change from generation of product to generation of product as we continue to get new products. So just FYI, so you're going to need an outdoor circuit breaker and an indoor circuit breaker, possibly another indoor circuit breaker. If you have an air handler with strip heat, if you have two air handlers, each with their own strip heat, obviously those are dedicated circuit breakers as well. So that's pretty much it for line voltage wiring. In the last video, we discussed to have another conversation with the electrician. And that conversation went something like this. Hey, Mr. or uh, Miss Electrician, do not apply power to any of my equipment until I'm totally done with my refrigerant piping. And the reason is because all of your indoor unit EEVs are cracked open from the factory. If you apply power before you're done with your refrigeration work, those EEVs will close. So it's just important to note to not apply power until you're fully done with your refrigeration piping and refrigerant has been added. So when it comes to communication wire, the way that you're going to run all of your wire is in what's called a daisy chain, which means you're going to start with the outdoor unit, you're going to land your wire, and then you're going to go to the first indoor unit and land your wire. And then from the first indoor unit, you're going to land another wire and go to the second indoor unit and land that wire. And then you're going to go from the second unit to the third unit, third to the fourth, fourth to the fifth, etc. until you get to the last unit, you land your wire and then you're done. Picture a daisy chain, if you don't already know what a daisy chain is, like when you were a little kid and you had that little dinosaur drawing. It was a dot to dot. You have to hit uh, the first dot with your pen and you got to connect all the dots without picking up your pen. You get to the end, you pick up your pen, you're done. Now you have a picture of a dinosaur. A daisy chain is kind of the same way. You go from unit to unit to unit to unit to unit. What you can't do is you can't go from the outdoor unit to the first indoor unit and then go from the first to the second and then go back to the first and run another wire from the first to the third. That's starring, that's branching. You can't branch your comm wires. You can't star your comm wires. It has to go from unit to unit and ideally with no splices in between. The reason is because the communication is a 16 volt DC communication. And the way that it travels, if you start branching off and starring and uh, splicing, you're going to lose those packets of information and the system is going to give you a U4 communication error code and you don't want that. So what you need to make sure you do is land the wires properly. You can go in any order. So I don't have to go to indoor one and then indoor two. I can go to indoor four and then I can go to indoor two and then indoor three and then indoor one. You just have to make sure you go from one unit to the next, from that unit to the next, from that unit to the next, never repeating. That is a daisy chain. So now that we understand a daisy chain, what we need to do is start at the outdoor unit. We're going to land our wire on F1, F2 in. There's two terminals. I'll put a picture of the outdoor unit terminal block up here so you can see there are two F1, F2 terminals. There's one that says in and there's one that says out. The terminal that says F1, F2 out is for an application where you have a centralized controller, a building management system, and you're daisy chaining multiple outdoor units together back to that BMS, back to that building management controller, which we're not doing in many of the residential applications that we're talking about today. So for today's video, ignore F1, F2 out. You want to focus on F1, F2 in. In, think of, oh, this is going to go to my indoor equipment. So you land your wire on F1, F2 in, and then you go to your first indoor unit, whichever indoor unit it is. I don't really care. It really doesn't matter. Just whatever indoor unit is easiest and smoothest for the install and you're going to land the other end of that wire on f1 f2 of the indoor unit terminal block i'll go ahead and i'll put a picture of the indoor unit terminal block up here on screen so you can see what that looks like there's only one f1 f2 to land it on and it even says transmission wiring so it's kind of hard to mess this part up now go to your box of wire pull out another pull of wire and you're going to land that wire on F1, F2 of the unit we just landed the first wire on. This is your daisy chain. Now you're going to come out of that indoor unit and you're going to go to the next indoor unit and you're going to land that wire on F1, F2 and then rinse and repeat until you've landed on all of your indoor unit F1, F2s. So now your daisy chain is done, but your indoor unit still has a couple more terminals that we need to talk about. And the first one's called P1, P2. P1, P2 is for your remote controller your thermostat and 
that's going to go straight down to the remote controller, to the thermostat that's going to be controlling that indoor unit. So if I have an indoor unit that serves, say, the master suite, I have a thermostat in the master suite, and that thermostat gets wired P1, P2 up to the indoor unit, P1, P2, that is supplying air to that space. The next indoor unit, let's say, serves the rest of the upstairs. That indoor unit is going to run P1, P2 down to the thermostat in that space. So from the thermostat to the indoor unit, that is a home run, one-to-one, -one, done. Your F1, F2 is a daisy chain. Then you have T1, T2, which in a residential application you'll rarely use. It is labeled forced off. Basically, it's a normally open contact, and if you close that contact, it forces the unit off. What we usually use it for, and I explain this in my nav controller video, so I'll put a card to the nav controller playlist up here at the top or up here at the top, whichever site it populates on, so you can go through that in greater detail. But T1, T2 is reprogrammable, which we will reprogram to be a normally closed set of contacts that you can use for your wet switch, your condensate pump alarm, uh, float switch contacts. And then if it opens in the uh, case of an alarm, you're going to get an error code. And depending on if you use T1, T2, it gives you an A0. But the indoor units, many of the indoor units have built-in pumps. So if you tie into one of those, you get an A3. But the T1, T2 will give you an A0. And if one indoor unit shuts down, they're all going to shut down. So if you do have, say, like the FXTQ air handler and you do end up using T1, T2 and you get an A0, you're actually going to have an A0 on the entire system. So that's something to ponder, something to keep in mind, and maybe a reason to not use T1, T2 for a condensate pump. But that's in general how it works. And again, I talk about this in way more detail in my nav controller playlist. So uh, feel free to check that out if you haven't already. As far as ComWire goes... That's pretty much it for communication wiring and for your line voltage wiring. There really isn't much to it. Again, um, make sure it's a daisy chain. Uh, also, as far as what type of wire should I use, I guess this is actually a, a really good point. As far as the type of wire you should use, it's 18 or 16 gauge, so there's the size. I prefer 18 gauge because it's much easier to wire into the NAV controller, the Madoka, the Daikin 1 smart thermostat. They have much smaller terminal screws on the controllers themselves. So I like to use 18 gauge. You can run 18 or 16 the same length. We have 6,000 feet of communication wire we can run within a system. So you're you're very rarely going to run out of wire, I should say, especially in a residential application. I've only ran out of that amount of length one time on a commercial job out of all these years, and it was a massive commercial job. And it had shielded wire, which we're not supposed to have shields. It's a non-shielded wire. If you add a shield, you reduce that 6,000 feet to just over 5,000 feet of allowable wiring. The shield really isn't necessary if you keep your comm wire away from line voltage. So typically we'll run the comm wire with the line set and either just run it in its own conduit or zip tie it to the line set. In certain areas you are and are not allowed to zip tie the comm wire with the line set. So always follow your local codes. Um, but I digress, you wanna make sure that it is non-shielded and then just keep that comm wire away from line voltage. That's really important. If you aren't going to be able to do that and you're running your comm wire with line voltage, then you need a shield. But then if you run a shield, you need to make sure that that entire daisy chain, that shield gets wired together all the way throughout and only grounded at one end. If you start grounding every single pole and everywhere that the shield exists, you're going to have uh, antenna effect, basically intermittent communication errors and units will be dropping out of the comm loop and it becomes this huge problem. So you definitely don't want any of that. Something else to consider is when you're running comm wire, one of the most important things to do is run stranded wire. A lot of folks will ask, well, can I run solid core? Can I run stat wire? And yeah, you can, but it's less reliable because the communication travels on the outside of the wire. If you get a nick or a break in the wire, you lose your communication. Running a stranded cable now gives you a redundant data packet in every one of the strands of that stranded cable. So it's always better to use stranded wire compared to your solid core, your thermostat wire types anytime you have communication. 
So to conclude, you guys, really, it's just make sure that each of your pieces of equipment get line voltage power and make sure that you run a daisy chain properly and you're pretty much done. So at this point now, we've done the refrigerant piping, the comm wire, we've done our pressure test, we've added the refrigerant, and we're ready to fire off the equipment. So this is about the halfway point in the series. The next several episodes are gonna to be totally focused on learning binary, startup procedures, uh, verifying the communication, doing force fan for troubleshooting purposes, resetting the addressing, uh, system test operation, uh, nav controller field settings, and bringing this all home, we will conclude with D-Checker operation and a little bit of discussion on that. I've already done a full episode on the D-Checker and looking at the data, so we'll just briefly talk about it to conclude everything and bring it all together. So you guys, I appreciate you tuning in. If you have any questions, as always, put them in the comments below. I read through all your guys' comments. I love the engagement and the interaction. Um, keep it coming. I do my best to answer all of your questions, you guys. There are no bad questions. If you're thinking it, somebody else is probably thinking it too. So if you guys enjoyed today's video, please click the like button below. It really helps out my channel. If you haven't already, please consider subscribing, you guys. I appreciate it. Thank you so much for watching Inverter Always. I hope you guys have an awesome day.